In August of 2014, Five Nights at Freddy's was released on Steam and immediately became a massive hit in the horror scene. Its style from gameplay to visuals was completely different from so much of what dominated the scene beforehand. In the following year, three sequels would be released and many Let's Players would make their careers off of it. Despite its success, its praise wasn't universal. Many criticized the games for being released too quickly, for being lazy, for being cash grabby, for appealing too much to an audience of cringy children. I was one of those children. The first game came out right before my 13th birthday. I was immediately hooked. I spent my time talking about the game and playing it with any friend who would listen, making YouTube videos diving into the deep and hidden story, and watching the Markiplier Let's Plays over and over again until I had them memorized. The games really captured people, including prospective game developers. It changed the horror landscape irrevocably. And then a new subgenre was born, commonly known as mascot horror. Founded on the success and appeal of Five Nights at Freddy's, utilizing many of the same tropes and appealing to the same audience. But as the years pushed on, a resentment started to build within the very communities that founded the subgenre. And now, many of the criticisms Five Nights at Freddy's was met with are being levied against the subgenre it founded by the community's very biggest diehard fans and supporters. What happened? Well, if you'll follow me, I want to take you on a journey through the evolution of mascot horror, from its humble beginnings in a dollar general to the now multi-million dollar, multimedia, multi-IP subgenre that it is today, and answer that very question. I was flipping through the channels. He lived in a pineapple. All I saw was static. Man, what the hell? There we go. All right, so before we get into the genre's evolution, I feel like we should come up with a workable definition of the subgenre, because it's a fairly new term, and I don't feel like I've seen a super clear definition as of yet. I believe the earliest use of the term was a John Wolf tweet, and it hasn't got much clearer since its inception. It's one of those things that you feel before you can explain, but that's not a super useful way to talk about a genre, so I'll see what I can do. Like most categories, it's difficult to pin down. There's a lot of gray area between what is considered mascot horror and what is not considered mascot horror. The best way that I could explain it is that mascot horror is a genre defined by its content and its context. The content being the tropes and execution of the media itself. The characters, the settings, the aesthetics, that sort of thing. The core tenet of mascot horror when it comes to content is its twisting of a seemingly child-friendly character, a mascot of a toy company, the animatronic characters of a family pizzeria, a cartoon train like Thomas the Tank Engine, taking these characters and making them demonic, haunted, evil, murderous, any or all of the above. That's the most important part of the content, where it gets its name, these horrifying mascots. Commonly, there's a whole cast of characters, sometimes just one. Other tropes include further exploration of these childhood elements, the environments being toy factories, play places, family restaurants, arcades. The other biggest aspect of the content you can identify mascot horror with is its use of lore in the way it tells its story. Pioneered like many aspects of mascot horror by Five Nights at Freddy's, you'll often find a huge part of the storytelling is not right out in the open. Easter eggs, hidden codes, obscure your items or notes, vague symbolism or clues are typically more important than having a traditional story arc. The plot's role is to be unraveled, decoded by the audience or player, the literal timeline or events often obscured to encourage a deeper look. If game theory could make a 20 minute video about it, you'd probably be on the right track. Trying to parse the story of many mascot horror games is sort of like a game within itself, one that doesn't always require even downloading and playing the game. If you've got a thorough enough let's player, you can be begin to put the pieces together yourself. Speaking of Let's Players and audiences, the context is the next important part of defining a mascot horror project. The cultural niche it resides in and how that niche interacts with it is especially key to understanding why it's become so popular and how its evolution led it to where it is today. Its horror 
that widely appeals to children and teenagers. This makes sense. Despite its twisting of the mascots, these are still characters designed to be appealing to those audiences in the first place. Speaking of, while this isn't true of all mascot horror, the marketability of these mascots and their IPs are often heavily utilized, especially with their young audience. Often, you'll see these series created out of the gate with an intent to sell merchandise, and usually stuff that will appeal to younger fans. Plushies, figurines, Legos. Because a core aspect of the horror is turning a childhood mascot into a villain, the marketability of the design isn't affected. Most 21st century children's media, from Transformers to Frozen, are built with their ability to sell merchandise for the company in mind. Naturally, if you're designing a character with inspiration from these, even if it is to make it terrifying, the marketability will bleed through. And mascot horror developers do not waste that opportunity. In addition, the way these games spread and find their audience is really specific too. Audiences typically find these games from YouTube Let's Players, whose viewers, if we're being honest, is for the most part somewhere in the range of 11 to 16. That's probably true of my channel as well, it's just the nature of the people who have more time to watch YouTube videos. Our analytics may say that it's mostly viewers between the age of 18 and 24, and hell, that could be true for some of us, but there's no accounting for viewers who aren't signed in, using their parents' account, or straight up lying about their age when making an account. Anyway. Let's Players and mascot horror developers, as well as most indie devs in general, have a sort of symbiotic relationship. Let's Players are able to make their living playing these games, and the attention the Let's Players give to the games then lead to new fans of the game, which means more sales, both of the game and of merch. The communities around these IPs also tend to stick together, because they're all interested in the same niche. Fan art often depicts the spooky mascots in what would be their normal kid-friendly state, and there's often a lot of fan content crossing over different series. And in the same way that they're marketable for merch, these series really hit with the algorithm, meaning they'll likely be promoted more than any artsy experimental horror game. That is my best, concise breakdown of what makes the genre. The intersection of both the content itself and the context it exists within. Mascot Horror, a subgenre of horror media popular on the internet, characterized by its twisting of children's mascots and aesthetics, ambiguous storytelling, and marketable characters, often geared towards children and teenagers. Probably not perfect, but I gave it my best shot, and it works for what we'll be talking about today. It's important to note that while some media may have a passing resemblance to mascot horror, this term doesn't apply to everything. I've heard some people use it to describe like teeny toys and to me that just doesn't seem to fit. It's a useful term, but be wary of using it in places where it doesn't fit, especially because it's used as such a derogatory term nowadays. That does open up an interesting question though. These sort of tropes have been used throughout horror media decades before the term mascot horror and before Five Nights at Freddy's itself. What makes this phenomenon different? To kick off our look at the evolution of mascot horror, let's talk about the time before. Earlier I mentioned a tweet by John Wolfe, initially discussing this idea of mascot horror, and it was met with some initial criticism. Hasn't this always kind of been a thing? What about slasher villains and similar tropes? They're not wrong. The tropes seen in mascot horror are not new, and the audience isn't really new either. When it comes to the idea of twisting a children's mascot, horror has been doing that for decades. One early example I found in the deepest depths of my research was something called the Advent on Channel 12 on a mascot horror iceberg post. It took me a while to find it. Whatever it was definitely deserved to be at the deepest level. Eventually, I did find it. It was a short story published in 1958 by C.M. Kornbluth shortly before his death, published in a collection titled Star Science Fiction 4. So I bought it. The story in question, Advent on Channel 12, is only three pages long. It details the rise of a children's television empire similar to Disney, starting with an animated show titled Poopy Panda Pals, which oddly enough sounds like one of those strange mascot horror games you'd find on page 400 of the FNAF tag on Game Jolt. It depicts the children enraptured by this brand, this mascot, as it cyclically promotes its own products into oblivion like a consumerist Ouroboros. And the Poopy Panda Pals plug the Poopy Panda Magazine. And the Poopy Panda Magazine plugs the Poopy Panda Land. And the Poopy Panda Land plugs the Poopy Panda Pals. This was probably Kornbluth's jab at the Walt Disney Company, recently having taken the world by storm with the Mickey Mouse Club and the opening of Disneyland. 
The story portrays the titular character as a sort of unsettling god, rising to power and control over the helpless public. And certain unclean ones which had gone before turned unbelieving from their monitors and said, Holy gee, this is awful. While the story functions more as a critique of the homogenous and all-consuming feedback loop of branding that Disney was pioneering at the time, and the character of Poopy Panda is never explicitly described as like a monster or anything, it still takes the concept of a marketable children's character and turns it into some sort of dark, almost demonic figure. Moving forward into the 70s and 80s, the rise of the slasher film begins to do something else we see in mascot horror. While Corn Blue's story went about criticizing the mass marketing of mascots, slasher films went all in on it. The masks, the outfits, the faces of their villains became perfect recognizable branding, easily slapped on t-shirts and mugs and sold every Halloween in the form of costumes with enough available sizes to dress your toddler as Jason Voorhees. So in a way, mascots have always been a part of horror. Even going back to the Universal Monster films, with iconic villains like Dracula, the Invisible Man, werewolves. Going back to slashers, we even have villains who play perfectly into the modern mascot horror trope of turning a children's character into a monster, with Chucky from Child's Play or Pennywise the Clown from It. But like we discussed, using similar tropes isn't all it takes to make something mascot horror. The audience and cultural context around the series is important too. Children enjoying horror has always and will always be a thing. There's no point in fighting against it. My entire fascination with horror media started when I was 10 or 11. So the audience was always around, and there's been horror franchises targeted at kids for decades. Goosebumps, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Some even have examples of utilizing these exact same mascot horror tropes. An episode of R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour from 2011, literally titled Mascot, tells the story of two students trying to replace the school mascot, Big Yellow, only to find out it's not a guy in a suit. It's a living costume that does not hesitate to terrorize them. Still, there is a unique difference in the way something like Goosebumps found its audience and that of the mascot horror genre. The biggest first stepping stone to that audience and niche was creepypastas. So pretty early in the internet's lifespan, a phenomenon known as chain mail became a thing. Emails and messages created with the intent of being sent along in an unending chain. The classic, send this to 10 of your friends format. Some of these took the form of scams asking for money under the guise of charity, joke posts, and some were meant to scare you. If you don't send this message to 10 friends, a demon girl will appear in your closet tonight. That kind of thing. Similarly, the term copy pasta was later used to describe messages or copy pasted, see where it got its name now, across the internet, either verbatim or slightly altered for comedic effect. Short horror stories and internet urban legends were spread this way too, earning them the name creepy pasta. Quickly, this became a popular internet niche, a community of horror writers creating and sharing their own little urban legends. And with more and more children and teens getting internet access, a whole new world of horror opened up to kids online. You could see the real stuff, blood, gore, torture, whatever disturbing thing your little heart desired was at your fingertips, no longer relegated to the sanitized horror that kids had access to before. On the internet, there was no MPAA, and you could create and share your own horror stories with a like-minded community with surprising ease. Don't get me wrong, a sizable portion of the creepypasta community were adults, finding an accessible accessible outlet and audience for their creative writing, and when children started filing into the forums and communities with increasing numbers, there was a lot of pushback. But children will always be fascinated with the taboos that their parents won't let them see, and if there's a way for them to find it, they will. My theory is that this is where the community that would eventually fall in love with mascot horror began. Pretty early on, creepypastas began forming their own subgenres and tropes. They created their own versions of slasher villains like Jeff the Killer and Tiki Toby, and your monsters like Slenderman, your rituals and summonings a la Bloody Mary, and then you have your Lost Episode and video game creepypastas, and this is where we begin to see something interesting. Lost Episode creepypastas typically involve a narrator detailing a lost or banned or secret episode of a television show with some disturbing aspect. Much of the time, these lost episodes focused on children's television. 
Squidward's Suicide, a mysterious episode of SpongeBob, a Nickelodeon intern finds, which featured images of murdered children and ends with Squidward shooting himself in the head. Most famously, Candle Cove, which takes the form of a series of forum discussions, where users discuss a television show they all remember watching, and their memories get growingly more ominous. Video game creepypastas, like the famous Ben Drown and the infamous Sonic.exe, show haunted or anomalous copies of popular video game titles like Majora's Mask or Sonic, not only telling a horror story, but often accompanied by footage, screenshots, or even a playable version of said game, sometimes including a distorted or malicious version of the game's characters, and often including a mystifying backstory. Are you starting to see the similarities? Adjacent to creepypastas in the internet horror landscape was the rise of indie horror let's plays, YouTube personalities like Markiplier creating an audience drawn to their commentary, and importantly, their reaction to jump scares and spooky games. <laughs> Games like Amnesia and Slender the Eight Pages are what really kicked this style of video off, and was the introduction to online horror, be it indie horror games or creepypastas, for a lot of young people, myself included. The community around these games also led to an explosion of new indie horror devs, and soon, a thriving horror ecosystem was spread around the web, right alongside creepypastas. In conjunction with that, I'd be remiss not to mention Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. I don't want to get too in-depth here because I've already made a whole video about the series before, but there's no denying. The series almost feels like proto-mascot horror, and in some ways, one of those lost episode creepypastas come to life. It features puppets in what appeared to be your average children's television show, but every video would have some sort of demented twist that slowly takes these puppets down gorier, more horrific avenues. On top of that, while the series was rich with themes and symbolism, audiences also began picking up on repeating patterns and characters, and began crafting their own theories about what the secret story being told through these surreal videos was. That is really important, because alongside creepypastas and indie horror games, the hidden story revealed, game theory type content around online horror was also gaining a footing, with the likes of the game theory and film theory channels, and independent web series like Marble Hornets, itself based on the Slenderman creepypasta, boosting the web series and ARG style of storytelling, which required a deeper look than just a single watch or playthrough would reveal. Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared specifically feels so ahead of its time in that respect, combining so many elements that nowadays are practically required to make a successful independent horror project, and doing them incredibly well. To shift back to creepypastas for a moment, these mascot horror parallels continue with the most popular creepypastas, the aforementioned Candle Cove and Ben Drown, but also in stories like Abandoned by Disney, which is still probably my favorite creepypasta. The Abandoned by Disney series, which takes place over a series of blog posts, tells the story of a photographer going to Disney's abandoned Mowgli's Palace Resort, and encounters a number of unsettling things, including the climax, in which the protagonist finds a color-inverted Mickey costume, and it comes to life. The story has since been an inspiration for many Five Nights at Freddy's fan games, and I'm sure you can start to see why, right? Moreover, I think what we're seeing is an audience of horror-loving kids and teenagers primed for the advent of a game that's going to take over the scene. Children's mascots turn evil, haunting stories of murdered children and ghostly costumes, stories with no clear answer, just a mystery to be interpreted. Adults and teenagers who grew up with these stories, and children who were already inundated with an internet full of them. And then Five Nights at Freddy's dropped. I've talked an exhaustive amount about Five Nights at Freddy's, so I won't go too deep into the woods here. Needless to say, the game made a massive splash when it released, with every popular internet gamer hopping on, holding it up as the scariest game in years. And it makes sense why. Its style of gameplay was really, really different from anything else coming out at the time, sticking you in a claustrophobic office and forcing you to wait for the characters to come to you. The way it played with revealing the story through these subtle, supernatural events occurring as you played, the way it capitalized on the fear of animatronics in a way that hadn't been done before, the way it created a unique and engaging balancing act of a gameplay loop, it did a lot right and it captured the internet audience. It also helped that it was incredibly accessible, with its cheap price and mobile versions. Everyone from your little cousin on the iPad to your favorite online gamer had access. Only a few months later, the sequel was released far ahead of schedule, doubling down on so much, and in my opinion, being the best of the entire series. Adding more explicit story and lore elements like the rare death mini games, introducing the PURPLE GAY, and doubling the characters. At this point, many of the tropes that would encompass mascot horror were standardized. The game was huge, an immediate classic, and with that popularity, especially among the kids who watched Let's Plays, myself included, 
and the quick turnaround time for the sequel came the criticisms I mentioned in the opening of this video, but they didn't change much. Five Nights at Freddy's was a phenomenon, and the sequels were coming out faster than you could keep track of if you weren't following closely. Maybe because the gameplay was so easy to replicate. Maybe it was because the concept could so easily be applied to so many things. Whatever it may have been, very early on, the community was struck with fan game fever. So the earliest fan game that I was able to track down was a game called Freddy Fazbear Pizza Massacre, released in November of 2014, just a couple months after the original game. It is really strange. It is a profoundly janky FPS where you mow down a lag-inducing amount of stock soldiers with Freddy Fazbear's texture plastered onto them. I genuinely cannot tell how much of this is ironic or satirical. Maybe it's all just going over my head, but whatever it may be, it was the first. So it's a fun little piece of history. One really interesting thing about this is that it was apparently made using FPS Creator Reloaded, which... I didn't think was a thing. I used FPS Creator all the time when I was a kid, even up to 2014, and eagerly awaited Reloaded when they announced it. Eventually, I stopped following it, and then Game Guru came out, which I assumed was what Reloaded turned into. But apparently, there was a brief time when FPS Creator Reloaded was actually a thing. Cool. So that's probably not the first game your mind goes to when thinking about early FNAF fan games. Five Nights at Treasure Island, Five Nights at Candies, Five Nights at Wario's, Five Nights at the Krusty Krab, One Night at Flumpty's. These are probably the ones that stick in our minds the most. This early era is really interesting, and I think a testament to just how versatile the FNAF formula was. You could drop just about any character into the game and have something novel, whether that be parodies of existing IPs or original characters and worlds. You didn't need to do much more than reskin the game as it already existed. Five Nights at Treasure Island, which did try some rudimentary new mechanics, grabs directly from the abandoned by Disney creepypasta and drops it into the office, mascot, security camera, night-based formula, and did a decent job for the time. Coming back to it, I can't say it terrifies me like it did back in the day, and its issues are so much more visible on a replay, but damn it, I think it still did a great job at creating a really unique atmosphere. Five Nights at Wario's and Five Nights at the Krusty Krab similarly take from existing IP IPs, Mario and Spongebob, and create their little spins on the formula. While Wario's is definitely really rough looking with the PNG collage look, it's obviously not meant to be taken completely seriously. Meanwhile, Five Nights at the Krusty Krab utilizes Unreal Engine to create a decently slick little 3D experience, with all the bloom, motion blur, and lens bokeh you've come to expect for a UE4 game. Meanwhile, One Night at Flumpty's and Five Nights at Candy's did something a little different. Instead of just placing an existing world or character in a FNAF game, they used it to house their original characters. While they function essentially as reskins of the original FNAF, what we're seeing is devs utilizing the concept of the game to express their own creative ideas and learn game development, which is really important to the evolution of this genre. They were pretty high quality, and their original characters made them unique, but things would start ramping up pretty quickly. As the quality and quantity of these fan games grew, so did a sort of mostly friendly competitive atmosphere. Devs flexing their skills, using the FNAF format to really play with mechanics, characters, and worlds. Pop Goes, Five Nights at Candy's 2 and 3, and my personal favorite fan game of all time, One Night at Flumpty's 2. It might be one of the best FNAF fan games, period, only really rivaled by FNAF 1 and 2 gameplay-wise, in my opinion. The waves of fan games flooded Game Jolt to the point where they needed to create an entire subcategory on the site. As the official FNAF game's own story became more expansive and mysterious, and as its mechanics changed with each game, so too did the fan games expand their own stories, characters, mechanics, and game development aspirations. Using the popularity of FNAF, a fan game could be the ticket to getting your game in front of millions, as YouTubers began picking up fan games in the short waiting periods between official FNAF releases, especially as those periods between games got longer and the audience became more impatient. These fan game devs began really picking up the pace, teams getting larger to execute even bigger concepts. A real turning point was when the joy of creation began production, showing just how far you could take the FNAF fan game. Game. creating a free roam, first-person experience, wandering dark hallways with the stunning graphics of Unreal Engine, and the incredible models and animation of the developer, Nixon. It felt like PT mixed with FNAF, almost a triple-A take on the formula, and it was a fan game. Personally, I almost prefer those early demos of the Joy of Creation to the final release. There's something 
almost nightmarish about them, let loose in these endless, nondescript household hallways trapped with an animatronic beast, barely dodging its glowing sightline. It's almost dreamlike in the most unsettling way. So as an aspiring game developer, the FNAF fan game world was a really attractive venture. You could gain attention and success from the FNAF name, get a fan base, and improve your dev skills all at once. Only one problem. You couldn't monetize your work, especially with the scope of the games and dev teams getting bigger as the competition heated up and the market evolved. The natural question was, could you make this work separately? Could you capture FNAF without being a direct fan game? So it's probably important to note that while I have these sections separated into distinct eras, there was a lot of overlap when these games and changes were happening. But from my memory and looking at the release dates of these games, early fan game works and projects were beginning in early 2015. And original IPs trying to make something of themselves using the FNAF formula, these early days of mascot horror, really started coming about in late 2015, early 2016. With that said, the first game I remember trying to take the FNAF formula and turn it into a standalone IP, although I'm sure it wasn't the first, was 123 Slaughter Me Street, released in September of 2015. Instead of animatronics, it was Tim Denson's terrifying puppets, not so subtly inspired by Jim Henson's puppets. While still opting for a gameplay style of limited movement, instead of sticking you in an office, it had you continuing down the hallway, using a flashlight and checking doorways. Instead of the night-based progression, you progress through floors. Similar to FNAF though, it created this sort of back and forth balancing act gameplay loop with the different puppets interacting with the player differently to create tension in the same way FNAF did. Its floors function similarly to knights in FNAF, and of course the puppets and animatronics are an obvious parallel. 123 Slaughter Me Street to me is a perfect encapsulation of what I find so fascinating about this era of mascot horror. These early attempts to understand what it was about FNAF that captured people. Was it night-based gameplay? Was it the gameplay loop, the way that each character had different patterns, rules, and weaknesses that had worked for so many fan games before? Was it the use of childhood robots and toys? These early attempts fascinate me, because while the formula of modern mascot horror seems so familiar now, these early games were the testing grounds trying different things and seeing what would stick. For instance, the game Sophie's Curse decided to do away entirely with the mascots and focus on the point and click style and resource management aspects, aesthetically and story-wise, going for the haunted house, creepy girl trope. Going back to play it, I'm almost surprised by how much I actually liked it. The gameplay loop is really engaging, the sound design is immersive, and it captures a really nostalgic feeling for me. I've always been a fan of old first-person point and click adventure games like Myst and the Nancy Drew games, and something about the low resolution pre-rendered look is just really appealing to me. And when it comes to the execution of the horror, there's a lot of little touches that I think were pretty effective. That portrait of a man in the dark can really startle you at times, and some of the animations are actually unsettling. For what it was attempting, I think it did a good job, but unfortunately it wasn't able to find that perfect formula that would later launch other FNAF inspired games into the stratosphere, though it did have a brief moment in the limelight with some Let's Players. On the flip side, Tattletale did away with many of the gameplay aspects of FNAF and opted for a focus on the nostalgic childhood robot angle, jumping ahead from the golden age of animatronic pizzerias in the 80s to the era of the Furby in the late 90s and early 2000s. Tattletale, all in all, is a really effective little horror game. It utilizes a nice retro VHS aesthetic that would later be synonymous with FNAF media with the advent of FNAF VHS videos. It uses night-based progression and, of course, the little robotic Furby motherfuckers. Otherwise, though, the gameplay is a lot more in line with what you'd expect from a typical indie horror game. Wandering in a dark house with a flashlight, avoiding the detection of a terrifying antagonist. And while it didn't quite ever reach the incredible heights of later mascot horror like Bendy or Poppy's Playtime, it's interesting to note that Tattletale, at least in my experience, lasted longer in the minds of horror fans than, say, Sophie's Curse. It almost feels ahead of its time in the specific aspects it drew from Five Nights at Freddy's to utilize for itself. 
Sophie's Curse as a game is much closer to Five Nights at Freddy's, but Tattletale was a lot closer to what many viewers liked about Five Nights at Freddy's. And I have a theory as to why the aesthetics of the game matter more than the gameplay itself, but I'll get into that later. Other games didn't find the balance quite as well, or didn't catch on in the same way. Boogeyman and Emily Wants to Play come to mind. They had their time in the spotlight, but it didn't have as much staying power. Boogeyman played essentially like a FNAF fan game, but this time set in a child's bedroom. For the record, we had seen that in FNAF at this point, fending off the Boogeyman with a flashlight. The game did have a following for a bit, I think mostly because it had a good amount of effort and quality behind it, consistent updates, something we'll see utilized later by other games too, and it played so much like a FNAF game that it was able to grab the attention of Let's Players looking to fill the void between Five Nights at Freddy's 4 and Sister Location. FNAF World was coming out, sure, but I think that's why people were especially crazy craving that FNAF gameplay formula, as FNAF World was completely and utterly different. Emily Wants to Play also got a decent amount of attention, and likewise with these other early mascot horror attempts, put together an interesting combination of aspects from Five Nights at Freddy's along with its own flair. Children's toys gone bad, a night-based system, enemies that have very specific rules that counter each other to create a gameplay loop. It also opted for more traditional movement, a haunted house setting, and a creepy girl at the center of it all. Again, it's the reason I find these early attempts so fascinating. Seeing the ways people tried taking combinations of ideas from Five Nights at Freddy's games to see what would work. Or at least that's what it appeared. I can't know for sure where they got their ideas from. But I do think it's pretty clear it's one of the things audiences found appealing about them at the time. While I'm clarifying here though, I should say I don't want to imply that every developer here is just looking to make a quick buck or bite off of FNAF. Five Nights at Freddy's was a huge step in indie horror, so of course the landscape was going to change with it. And a lot of developers, myself included, more on that later, genuinely really liked Five Nights at Freddy's and wanted to experiment with what it did creatively ourselves. This era was also when we start to see early criticisms of mascot horror start to pop up from within the community. There were lots of games, for instance, The Dolls, that were not well received. The Dolls was essentially just a reskin of FNAF using Unity store assets. The reviews reveal the sentiments of the time, a cheap knockoff, a soulish cash grab, etc. Something on a larger scale, like Case Animatronics, also had a helping of criticism with the use of actual animatronics as enemies, but still trying to be not a fan game, attracting some scrutiny. It also didn't help that it was pretty buggy. Interestingly to me, Case Animatronics also seems to be heavily based... based on the fan-made SFM FNAF 3 trailer by Golden Lane Studios. In any case, <laughs> Case Animatronics was also a sign of something else. The scope of these projects once again expanding, from the gameplay and story aspirations to dev teams. So, Case Animatronics hadn't found the right balance, wasn't able to create an identity for itself, and was a little buggy. But eventually, someone would find the right formula. And in 2017, we can see these projects start to emerge. So, in September of 2017, this game comes out called Duck Season. It was a VR game developed by Stress Level Zero, a VR game studio. It's a horror game, but you wouldn't guess it at first glance. The horror is just under the surface, something darker underlying the cheerily stylized 80s childhood world and the smiling visage of the duck season dog mascot. That mascot ends up being a murderous virtual cryptid, but many of the story's details you'd only be able to find through careful observation of various easter eggs and items. Despite a few moments of bloody horror, it's fairly tame and humorous too, and its style is pretty appealing. Now VR was, and still is, a pretty financial restrictive medium. To even play, you'll have needed to invest hundreds to thousands of dollars into a VR setup. Despite this barrier to entry, Duck Season found a level of popularity that many indie horror games would envy. Now, its time in the limelight didn't last too long, as the studio moved on to larger and even more successful projects. Ever heard of Boneworks? But while it may or may not have done it on purpose, Duck Season had stumbled upon what we might consider to be the successful formula for a mascot horror game. 
It was actually one of a few that year. The beginning of modern mascot horror for many was Bendy and the Ink Machine, a game that released its first chapter in February of 2017. The game essentially standardized the formula. The specific ingredients that could be taken from its predecessors, like FNAF and Creepypastas and the like, and how to put them together. The studio environment, the story of some kind of mad villain, people turned into or haunting the mascots that become the antagonists, and sometimes in the case of Benny and the Ink Machine, even the cast of friendly characters. Tropes that permeate mascot horror. In addition, the focusing on the expanding deep lore elements that could be theorized about. Bendy even being criticized by some for seemingly waiting for the theory community to come up with the story for them. It standardized another important piece too the chapter release system. Now, of course Benny and the Ink Machine didn't invent the chapter-based release system for games, but when it comes to its association with mascot horror, Bendy really set the stage. See, the Five Nights at Freddy's games had all come out mere months apart, allowing them to stay in the spotlight continuously. That's really useful when your marketing strategy is based on Let's Players having something to play, something for the YouTube algorithm to stick to, and a community having lore elements to pick apart. It also helps when a large part of your audience is young people on the internet, not a demographic graphic known for their long attention spans. For Five Nights at Freddy's, it was a relatively achievable goal to put games out that fast. Once you've put the main gameplay elements together, you're essentially repeating the same thing for Five Nights. All in all, without deaths, you could beat most of these games in under an hour. Throw in some enticing secrets and boom, your game is done. Obviously, there's a bit more to it, but comparing that style of game to the larger scopes that were coming out of the fan community, it's just hard to keep releasing full games that quickly. So Bendy opted for a chapter-based system releasing short 20 to 30 minute portions of a game via chapters. And it worked really well. It wasn't without criticism, many thought its gameplay was a bit dull, but it had such a unique style and some decent scares, along with an alluring mystery perfect for the theory crowd. What was the ink machine? What happened to this place? How does our character fit into it all? Around this time, another game that was already in development seemed to have picked up on these same patterns. A game that had initially tried its hand at coming up with a unique selling point and gameplay gimmick, but would quickly hitch its wagon to the newly sprouting mascot horror formula. Hello Neighbor is a game I've discussed at length in a previous video. That video was my first real attempt to tackle the concept of mascot horror, although at the time I called it post-FNAF indie horror. For better or for worse, that video did way better than I thought it would, and I don't really know how much effect the video had, but Game Theory brought it up in his response to some of the mascot horror trends we've been discussing, so it had some impact. All of this is to say, I've already talked about the game in detail in this specific setting, so I won't go too far into it. But for those who may not have seen that, Hello Neighbor was a highly stylized, kid-friendly horror game, initially sold on its unique AI system and breaking and entering premise. But quickly, as new early access versions began releasing, it pulled its attention toward replicating tropes in the mascot horror genre. It's hard to throw this directly in with the genre because it doesn't literally have that evil children's mascot, but it does have basically everything else, including the community. Instead of releasing the game in chapters, Hello Neighbor released various alpha and beta builds, which had the advantage of not even really needing the expectation of the game functioning properly. As the gameplay of these releases strayed further from its initial premise and quality, the lore elements were continually expanding. It didn't really matter that the game was unfinished and increasingly less fun to play, at least in my opinion. The frequent updates meant lore drops, and that is is where I think we get into one of the most fascinating things about this whole genre as it is now. Okay, big personal interpretation moment here. This is just the genre as I see it, in my opinion, although that disclaimer should go over everything I've set up to this point too. I mentioned earlier how I thought that a big part of Five Nights at Freddy's success was its accessibility. It had mobile ports, it was cheap, it had very low minimum PC specs. Hell, if you couldn't play it, just watch any of the hundreds of YouTube Let's Players give it a go. And that's where something interesting starts. This phenomenon of watching someone play something instead of playing it yourself wasn't new, as I mentioned earlier with the rise of Let's Plays, but what I think we see with mascot horror around this time is games succeeding regardless of their gameplay, because that's not what the audience is there for. I'm sure some did genuinely enjoy the gameplay of Hello Neighbor when it wasn't completely broken, or Benny and the Ink Machine, but criticisms of dullness or bugginess are irrelevant anyway, because the audience is getting increasingly younger, which means less access to a decent PC or financial independence, and increasingly more focused on theorizing about the secret lore behind these games. It doesn't matter if the gameplay isn't fun or working correctly at all when a large part of your community isn't even playing the game. 
they're watching it. Whether you like the gameplay of these examples or not, no shade if you do, the point I'm making is that the success of a mascot horror project isn't necessarily based on whether it's a good game or not. It's how well it can consistently keep an audience of young viewers engaged with lore, frequent updates, and catchy designs slash characters. Even if you weren't selling tons of copies of the game, you could always make that up with plushy and action figure deals at Target. I hope at this point in the video I haven't seemed too harsh. None of this is a call out post to any specific one of these games or devs. I'm not a huge fan of mascot horror at this point, but I totally understand that some people are. I also totally understand that if you're a dev wanting to actually make a living making games, this is a totally appealing venture. There are some other games around this time that fit the bill, Baldi's Basics and Granny come to mind, but they're a little different, I think. I think Granny caught on with this audience because of the aforementioned accessibility with it being a mobile game. Sure, you could consider the Granny character a mascot, but the game to me always felt more like a puppet combo game than anything else. But because of its easy access, I think it found its way into the young, horror-loving audience. Baldi's Basics is kind of similar. It does fit the bill in some aspects, but its lore is is always played as more of a goof, and I think almost unintentionally fell into the mascot horror genre. It's actually a really unique, fun project that if you wrote it off before because you don't like mascot horror, I'd suggest giving a second chance. Lastly, I just want to talk about Alphabet Lane. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but back around I think 2016, I wanted to make my own little FNAF inspired game and began formulating ideas, which would eventually take form and be released in 2017 and 2018, which fits this era. After the Silver Eyes released and I saw some people play 123 Slaughter Me Street, I began work on Alphabet Lane, an evil Sesame Street game. It was bad. I wasn't very good at game development. I did get Markiplier to play it though. That was a surreal day. It definitely followed all the modern mascot horror tropes before some of them even hit the mainstream. Yeah, I'm that cool. The studio setting, the hidden lore, etc. I wanted to bring it up for two reasons. I do have personal experience making a bad mascot horror game, and I'm very empathetic to mascot horror developers. I think it's an unfair characterization to imply that all these developers are making these games just as a passionless cash grab. Alphabet Lane was very derivative, but I made it because I really wanted to, not because I was some cynical asshole. Sure, a lot of the bigger studios have made decisions worth criticism, which I will mention briefly later, but I think behind most of these games are devs that really do care about making games. I also wanted to bring it up because I am working on Alphabet Lane 2, which may seem like a weird announcement in this video that seems vaguely critical of mascot horror, but I can't really get into specifics yet without spoiling the whole thing. My first devlog for the game is up on my Patreon where I give a little more insight, so check that out if you want. Anyway, so the formula for mascot horror was here to stay. People had found what the correct ingredients were and the perfect balance of those. It was really successful. Bendy's continued, more games started popping up. That's pretty close to where we are with modern mascot horror. So, Bendy and Hello Neighbor continued, Bendy eventually releasing Bendy and the Dark Revival, and Hello Neighbor recently coming out with a sequel as well. And the reception continued to be fairly mixed, a pretty dedicated fanbase but some discontent and criticism growing as well. Some other notable games came out during this time, Choo Choo Charles comes to mind. I actually really enjoyed it, taking control of a battle train to fight off a demonic Thomas the Tank Engine on a moody, rainy island. I actually have a review of that up on my Patreon if you want to see that, <laughs> But the game that I think really propelled us into this modern age of mascot horror was Poppy Playtime. There's a lot of gritty details here that I could talk about when it comes to Enchanted Mob, and Mob Entertainment, and the creation of Poppy Playtime, and there have been numerous videos about this topic, but I'll try to simplify it to the best of my ability. Enchanted Mob, also Xamination, but whatever, is an animation channel that specializes in high quality, Gen Alpha sensory crossover videos. Minecraft themed skits that are essentially Friday Night Funkin' Boyfriend, FNAF Freddy, Benny and the Ink Machine Among Us. Having watched a few of these videos, it's not the worst thing a kid could be watching on YouTube, and there are clearly some talented animators behind it, but I can't help but get the feeling it's just algorithm fodder for children to turn their brains off to, with some honestly pretty abhorrent clickbait in the mix. The popular sentiment seems to be that their earlier work was a channel genuinely just participating in fandom, 
but became more corporate over time. Anyway, clearly there was some talent behind this team that didn't have a fantastic outlet for that. So, Enchanted Mob is already in the fandom surrounding mascot horror, has a lot of experience in finding what succeeds in the online horror landscape and the YouTube algorithm, and they've got the weight of an entire animation studio behind them at this point. So, they start a game studio called Mob Games, and develop Poppy Playtime. The game really seems like a distillation of the entire genre up to this point, the good and the bad. The first bit of the game was released as a 30 minute chapter one, with all the tropes. The toy factory, the marketable mascots, the secret lore. It took every element of this modern mascot horror style and packaged it into essentially a 30 minute demo. Its marketing also embraced adjacent genres with overlapping fandoms like analog horror and FNAF VHS, and it was immediately incredibly successful, especially because they already had millions of the genre's fans they could advertise to. Along with that, it also sped ran the we'll say expansion. Merch, a movie deal, eventually lore NFTs, all before the second chapter even released. Despite a promising start with really slick animation and graphics and a decent ending chase sequence, the immediate eagerness to embrace overt commercialism raised some eyebrows, especially the more controversial ones like the lore NFTs or acquiring a movie deal when they had such sparse amounts of actual gameplay content. And it didn't help that Enchanted Mob came under fire soon after, with controversy around their treatment of employees and other creators in the space. To be fair though, in the mascot horror world, they weren't the only ones. Between 2019 and 2021, the mascot horror world felt like it couldn't catch a break. It felt like one controversy after the next, relating to everything from developers and studios to game delays and quality issues. For those of you in the community at the time, you'll be able to count off the top of your head at least enough to fit on two hands and it reached every major mascot horror IP, from Five Nights at Freddy's officially, to the FNAF fan game world, to the team behind Bendy, to previously mentioned issues at Mob Games, and so on and so on. I debated how much I should get into any of these, but I think getting too much into the details would just distract from the main point. I don't want to completely derail the comments section. There's a lot of nuance and detail in each one of these that I could not do justice in this video, so all that's really important here for the sake of this video is this. Not only were we seeing the rising corporatization of the mascot horror scene, with every target and mall filled with the smiling faces of endless mascot horror plushies, but we're also seeing rising discord and divisiveness within the community as well. It just wasn't as pleasant a place to be as it once was, and it was becoming harder to view the niche with the same rose-colored glasses. There was a growing discontent in the community, a sense that things were getting worse, that something was very, very wrong with this thing that everyone had once loved. There was a feeling that things just weren't the same. The community had been in a constant tsunami of divisive capital D discourse. Studios and developers behind the games were under increasing scrutiny. The games were getting worse or just not improving. And with each new game that fit the mascot horror bill, regardless of the quality of the game itself, there was almost an automatic resentment. Everything just felt like a hollow trend hopper. It didn't help that while these games had always had a young fan base, the direction of the genre felt increasingly more mascot and less horror. And all of these factors continued building beneath the surface, this restlessness and resentment festering and growing, and it all came to a head with Garden of Ban Ban. So, Garden of Ban Ban on the surface seems like your standard mascot horror game. It's got the colorful children's mascots, the facility, this time a kindergarten, the mysterious lore and backstory and chapter system, in this case just making super short sequels really fast. It's pretty easy to tell by playing the games that it's really amateur and definitely has its issues. Created by the duo dev team The Euphoric Bros, its issues range from gameplay to optimization to a whole host of other things. Nonetheless, it looks like it would fit right in alongside, say, Poppy Playtime. When I first saw it, I didn't really have a second thought. It felt like just another mascot horror game. But something was different about this one. It's time in the spotlight didn't peek with a screenshot of a wacky doco thumbnail and a collage of others to be gawked at and then blown over in a week. This game festered in the minds of Twitter user and YouTuber alike, eating away at the public psyche, the spark that set the smoldering frustration ablaze. 
and suddenly the heat became too much and it boiled over. Video after video, tweet after tweet, Garden of Banban wasn't just a game, it was an omen. The death of mascot horror, the worst indie horror game ever made. Rolling tidal waves of critique and hatred and anger and mean-spirited comment and joke flooding the replies of the devs' Twitter, flooding the YouTube upload feed. The growing pains of a genre in an evolving state, laser focused into a single source, a dark mark on the horror landscape, a symbol of the lowering standards and the increasing greed of untalented devs looking to make a quick buck. It was just that bad. But was it? Was it really? Looking at the reaction the internet had to Garden of Banban, I couldn't help but feel like I was going crazy. The reaction to the game compared to others for what it was seemed completely out of proportion. The needle of the discussion kept pushing further and further until people were saying and doing things I don't think they would have otherwise. It went from a passive sort of shocked amusement to flooding the devs every tweet with make better games or just stop bro, far outweighing whatever small mostly ironic niche of supporters there were at the time. Even real critique was packaged with this hurtful language. It eventually led to the devs leaving Twitter. This could have been a pause for self-reflection, but most of their worst critics just called them babies and not worthy of respect for blocking them and eventually leaving. What happened to Garden of Banban was what initially sparked my interest in writing this video. I saw the chaos unfolding and couldn't help but think, how did we get here? What I think I found while making this video is that it wasn't about Garden of Banban specifically. The controversies leading up to the game's release had primed and normalized the community to this kind of discussion and content, and it just was an easy target for the building resentment towards the trends in mascot horror, because it didn't have a lot of the redeeming qualities in terms of animation or gameplay quality. It was doing all the same things that everyone else was doing, it just wasn't doing them well, because it didn't have the same money or crew behind it. While many very popular projects like Poppy Playtime or Bendy and the Ink Machine did the same things or worse with merch or development conditions, Ban Ban got the worst of it because a fun game didn't come out of it. In the end, its greatest sin was that it just wasn't a very good game. And that's where my real problem with how the community reacted lies. There's a lot of objectionable behavior I saw while watching the Ban Ban Swarm. I don't want to make a list of every Twitter post or YouTube video I didn't like, but for instance, I found the trend of speedrunning the game to refund it or sending your refund screenshot to the devs on Twitter particularly bad. First of all, there's no reason to do that other than to hurt the devs, and it creates a really bad atmosphere between developers and creators slash audiences. Of course, if you didn't get what you paid for and you'd like your money back, you absolutely have the right to use the Steam refund. But if you knew what you were getting into, and especially if you were a YouTuber or streamer who made back many times the amount you paid, it's just a bad look. Especially if you're bragging about it to your audience or to the euphoric bros themselves. In my experience, and importantly in my opinion, I've noticed a phenomenon when these large online movements start pushing the boundaries as to what might be acceptable and what's just mean-spirited bullying. People who would generally frown upon the behavior they themselves are now exhibiting tend to either disengage or continue to get swept forward by the momentum of the community and start to justify their actions backwards almost. Find reasons that the things they've said or been thinking are okay in this instance. Well, it's clear the Garden of Bandman devs are just cynical grifters making shitty games with no passion just to squeeze money out of children. First of all, that kind of characterization is really hard to make with complete confidence unless you're talking about like a corporate entity and not two brothers. But also, I don't think much of the justification holds up once you see how the discourse has shifted as the euphoric bros have slowly been improving with each subsequent game. As each new game became slightly more playable and fixed more issues, all of a sudden the game has some redeeming qualities and might actually be worthwhile. Really? Sure, it's becoming less rough around the edges, and I mean, there is some goofy stuff in Chapter 3 that I did think was fun. There's stuff to like about it. But many of the issues people complained about haven't changed, because they're issues with the genre as a whole. Again, it feels like the only logical conclusion you can reach when looking at how the internet treated Garden of Ban Ban is that the game deserved to be bullied because it just wasn't very good. And personally, I don't think that's a good enough justification for some of the ways people acted. And that leads me to the thing that worried me the most about this whole situation. The most concerning thing about this whole situation has been seeing how some other small developers are taking it. It's a growing fear that if you don't make something good right out the gate, if you are perceived as making a cash grab or something uninspired, that you are opening yourself up to becoming Twitter and YouTube's next laughing stock. 
that content creators will make many times your salary off dunking on you and you'll be swallowed whole by this online machine. It doesn't just affect indie devs either. I've seen developers to writers to pen and paper artists voice fears about sharing their work in the increasingly harsh landscape, especially after Garden of Ban Ban. And you see this shared all over the independent horror niche, in places like Analog Horror or This Game I Found, related, see, there will never be another Petscop. So far, these have been my thoughts up to this point, the things I was thinking while watching this whole thing unfold. I felt like I was watching something special, something unique to Garden of Ban Ban. But eventually, things died down with Ban Ban, and they didn't go completely quiet. This whole notion that indie horror was dead and mascot horror killed it kept popping up, plucking whatever new game 8-Bit Ryan or Markiplier happened to play that week and branding it as the new omen of the genre's death. It happened to Amanda the Adventurer, a unique little puzzle horror game that combines the tropes of mascot horror and analog horror into a spooky horror experience. But what I think started happening then is that the pendulum started swinging the other way. A lot of creators who had been in the independent horror community for a long time started to push back against this idea that indie horror was dead, and that many of these games deserved the reaction they were getting. This was far from the worst state that indie horror community has been in, and in many ways, independent horror games are thriving right now. I should clarify, criticism is of course okay. It's not usually my thing, but I've made critical videos in the past. While there's aspects to some of them that I may have done differently now, I mostly stand by them. Genuine constructive criticism can also be incredibly important in the evolution of a developer or artist's work. But even if you're just a random Twitter user or YouTube commenter, and especially if you're someone with an audience, the way you criticize and the context in which you do matters if you care about creating a positive environment for artists. It's important to understand what direction you're punching and how your actions may affect the people watching. The developers themselves, your audience, other independent artists who may be terrified of what will happen to them. Taking shots at the big fish in big studios is one thing, but is the precedent that we want to set really that any random indie game made by a couple students can be plucked from the nearly infinite library of poorly made games online to become a target until we've driven them away? I don't think it should be the standard that to be treated with respect, you not only have to know how to make good content, but also how to deftly navigate a sudden spotlight of criticism. I imagine that if Alphabet Lane had been the focus of something like this, I wouldn't have had any clue how to navigate that kind of negative attention. And I think people should be treated with decency, even if they aren't great at taking criticism. The way the community sometimes reacts to games like Bandan or Amanda the Adventurer, in the end I think is counterproductive. No problem was fixed, nothing of value was gained, and the problems with mascot horror as it is today are the exact same, except maybe there's a few developers who would have made something really cool who are afraid to put it out there now. Because the problem of mascot horror isn't down to the individual developers. They may not know it, but all of the Twitter users and all of the YouTube commenters, all of the Twitch streamers and YouTubers are feeding into the exact same issue. By even making this video, I am too because it isn't about any specific game or developer. It's about a much bigger beast. Erm, um, yeah. This is the worst horror game I've ever seen. Hey YouTube, what's up? Mr. Geeky here, and today, I I think it's a misunderstanding of the actual issues of mascot horror to level the fault at developers or creators themselves. To throw your hands up and say, why don't people just make more original good games? It's not hard. Even some aspects of the community that I've criticized here aren't the issue. Because when you look at how mascot horror has slowly become more trope filled and commercialized, games releasing faster and feeling less inspired, it's understandable to start feeling disillusioned with the genre as it is today. But I think there's a systematic root to this issue that people are pushing to the side because it's easier to focus on the specific developers. It's one element I've mentioned quite a few times so far but brushed over, something that seems to follow and shape the genre's evolution. It's YouTube's algorithm. Now it's pretty much impossible for me to give a completely detailed and accurate explanation of how the YouTube algorithm actually works, even the folks at YouTube don't know, which is one of the reasons there's so much superstition around the mechanism in the first place, and why it's become such a buzzword recently. 
but I'll try my best to explain some of the consequences of the algorithm as I see it. All you really need to know about YouTube's algorithm is that what it wants is viewer retention. You, the user, to stay on the website as long as possible. And using machine learning, it decides what videos to show to who, which ones to give more exposure, and which to bury. That is YouTube's goal. Take up as much of your time as possible. To be fair though, that seems to be the main business model of most content platforms that utilize ads in exchange for free use. For instance, with TikTok, even though it's a far more short form focused, its algorithm focuses on how to get you to keep watching until the next video. Video content platforms are trying as hard as they possibly can to get you to stick around, to consume as much content on their platforms as possible. I also mentioned earlier that YouTube and Let's Players have become a pretty dependable advertising venture for indie horror games at this point. That may have been a bit of an understatement. YouTubers catching onto your game and the algorithm supporting those videos is one of the most important things to your game's success, especially in the mascot horror genre. This ecosystem and the way that YouTube's algorithm interacts with it I think is the issue. It rewards clickable videos, frequent uploads, and long watch time. And I think these elements can be tied directly to the trends we see in mascot horror. Colorful, cartoonish faces of mascots make for good thumbnails, games or chapters coming out quickly giving YouTubers frequent updates to upload videos, lower quality control or poor working conditions as the games need to fill more content in less development time. And in the same way, it's why mascot horror games seem to be everywhere, but it's hard to find more unique or experimental games. If you spend spend a year on a 10 minute experimental psychological horror thriller, it may very well be leagues above Poppy Playtime or Garden of Ban Ban, and it may even get some YouTubers to play it, but YouTube just isn't going to keep it around. Most concerning to me is how we see the audience of mascot horror seem to trend toward younger audiences, or at least that's what it's felt like over the years. The platforms who run these websites profit from colonizing your attention span, and the attention spans of children. When the success of your passion is reliant on YouTube, who do you think is watching most of that content? Children have more time to be watching YouTube videos, increasingly more access, and are in some ways the most susceptible to the tactics YouTubers use to get clicks in the first place. The smiling, colorful faces of the mascots, the big, bold letters. And this isn't only the case with mascot horror. YouTubers do this everywhere turning up the brightness and saturation on someone's eyes in a thumbnail, finding the specific font and color choice in a background, putting incredibly distracting but attention-grabbing subtitles popping up as they yell at the camera. It's the reason so many people, myself included, find Mr. Beast's videos so unsettling. This doesn't look fucking human, but it works, especially with kids. Let me give you an insane example as to just how broken this system is. Earlier, I characterized Garden of Ban Ban as a random indie horror game plucked from the masses. Well, it kind of was at the time, but in the months since that initial wave, it has gained a large following, in part, I think, due to the backlash that initially spawned. But now, you've got a ton of young people who are legitimate fans, whether ironically or not. It's become almost startlingly large. And while you might assume that because of its success, the Euphoric Brothers are finally riding high, well, I don't know how they're doing, but I don't think they're the ones seeing the most benefit from the game's success. Even with the insane turnaround time the Euphoric Bros have had with these games, the algorithm is still moving too fast. There is an entire ecosystem of YouTube channels creating fake gameplay of Garden of Ban Ban, even throwing in their own new characters, making new content for the game before the devs can. Before Garden of Ban Ban 3 even released, there was fake animations pretending to be early footage or new trailers, and now it's this weird little community where they fight each other over who stole whose original character, despite literally being entirely based on tricking people into thinking you're someone else's game. And somehow, these videos get millions of views. I can only guess from children who aren't able to discern what's real or just don't care. And YouTube eats this up because they can produce these so fast. In fact, let me take this moment to quickly say that YouTube's kids' content is fucking crazy, and please be mindful of what you're having your kids watch. If it's people screaming and huge subtitles popping up, please don't let your kids just sit and watch that for hours. This is coming from someone who grew up watching YouTube. It's not good for your brain. But again, the fault is not entirely down to the individual choices of individual creators, because YouTube rewards this. It's this feedback loop, as YouTube content creators are completely reliant on those algorithms for success, and indie game developers are completely reliant on those YouTubers for success, and the ever-shortening attention span of the audience who gives success to these creators, devs, and YouTubers, which is in turn
concern caused by the algorithms and platforms all these things function on in the first place, by constantly feeding ever-specified content to the end user, thereby contributing to an overall narrowing of what tropes and media succeeds as the pool is slowly closed like a vice grip around what the algorithm thinks you'd be interested in. It practically necessitates you create something that hops on the trend. I just don't think it's useful to characterize developers as these greedy sellouts. I think what's really happening is developers who want to do this for a living being stuck in a really shitty system to get that done. If you're somebody who really wants to make YouTube videos or indie horror games for a living and you're stuck in this system, you can start to see why developers and content creators would get caught up in this. Scott Cawthon saw it too. Remember, the story goes that Scott Cawthon was working at a dollar store, and FNAF was his last ditch effort at making game development a career. And then, when he struck gold, he grabbed a hold of it, releasing multiple sequels in under a year. And he was called out for it, criticized for making cash grab, lazy games. And guess what? They were cash grabs. The attention span of relevancy was short, and he didn't let that slip through his fingers. So he pushed out three sequels in less than a year. Now, I'm not saying that every random game jolt mascot horror spinky special daytime care game is the same as those first FNAF games. The first FNAF games are, in my opinion, really incredible and groundbreaking horror media. But they were coming from a guy many decades the senior of this wave's devs who'd been making games since before they were born. And since 2014, the algorithm and content sphere has changed drastically. The speed of relevancy has increased. People are holding on for dear life as the machine churns us at breakneck speeds. Sure, you could argue that Scott Cawthon's creation of FNAF only only exists because of a harsh review of a previous game, and it is admirable to be able to take critique in such a way. But should he have listened to his critics in that first year, who said he was milking it and making uninspired cash grabs? Well, it seems like he made the right choice now. He saw the audience he had, and he took advantage of it, specifically giving early versions of the game to YouTubers. He knew what he was doing. And other big names in mascot horror that are praised, like Choo Choo Charles, do the same thing. It's just the reality of the system we work under right now. Actually, kind of on the note of Choo Choo Charles and ex expectations of developers and creators, I want to quickly mention something else here. I think we need to understand that these young one dev teams creating insanely good pieces of horror media like Kane Pixels, Two Star Games, Tony of Petscop, they are not and never will be the norm. How does Sturgeon's Law go again? 90% of everything is crap. When you level criticism at small developers, one sentiment you'll often see is that we can see examples of single developers or creators like Two Star Games and Kane Pixels creating media of extreme quality. So being young or a small team is no excuse for making something bad. Except being a young single dev is absolutely an excuse. That's incredibly difficult. It's difficult for even massive studios to make a halfway decent game. If you're going to be interacting with independent media online, you have to hold room for the fact that not everything is going to be as amazing as the outliers and meet them where they're at. Backrooms, found footage, pet scop, choo choo charles are exceptions, not the rule. Anyway, so if this is the predicament we're in with the current ecosystem, is that it? Is mascot horror doomed to hollow trend hopping and indie horror in general under the crushing weight of mascot horror? I don't think so. I think there is something that can be done. I think the way to solve the issue of unoriginal or cash grabby games first is to actually understand why this stuff is happening. And instead of blaming it on specific developers, understanding why the current landscape encourages these things. Then we can try to encourage and support projects that break this cycle. There are literally dozens and dozens of incredible and unique indie horror games releasing all the time, and just because the YouTube algorithm doesn't like them as much as Poppy Playtime Chapter 114 doesn't mean they're not worthy of being talked about. If you're a creator or just a Twitter user, I promise you there's incredible art out there whose creators and niche would love some extra attention and discussion that you could spend your energy on instead of, say, part 25 of why mascot horror is killing horror. I see there's a little hypocrisy in that statement coming from me who just spent the last hour talking about mascot horror, but I don't have a butt. I'm sorry. Also, I think allowing developers to learn by doing and sometimes failing is important. And if we're going to critique, have empathy and understand that we're all in the same boat here. I would also like to quickly mention a secondary issue that is popping up that I think may be another reason people are becoming disillusioned with modern mascot horror and even other genres like analog horror. A lot of people are tired of modern mascot horror, citing how it's overrun with stuff made for kids and uninspired, not like the good old days. Erm, Five Nights at Freddy's is PG-13? Remember when it was a scary gore fest that would definitely be rated R? Look, the genre has definitely evolved, 
But I think what people aren't realizing is they've evolved too. We've grown up. Most of us were kids when that first FNAF game came out. It was already appealing to children, no matter how much we want to claim it's gory and dark. The truth is, that stuff has always appealed to kids. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want something kids don't like, it'll probably be a lot more boring than FNAF or existentially terrifying. We don't need to be embarrassed for liking things that also appeal to kids. There should be a market of horror for kids to be able to explore. It's a powerful genre, but maybe we can recognize that some of these issues just come with the territory. Of course, Rainbow Friends or a Roblox horror games aren't going to be masterpieces of challenging gameplay and terror. If you find yourself in this position, the same one I found myself in over the past couple years, as I saw mascot horror changing and my own tastes changing, the thing I'd really suggest more than anything is explore outside of mascot horror, hell, outside of your standard online horror formats. Find a niche you really love, find some topic that just draws you in. The truth is, indie horror is thriving right now, and there have been some big hits that are completely unique and interesting. If you'd like some help with where to start, I figured I'd end the video with some personal suggestions. To start, I want to name some games that I think might technically fit the mascot horror bill, but seem to be pushing the genre in really interesting ways. Input 6 is a really interesting horror game that plays with time and perspective in a VHS aesthetic as you're hunted by uncanny robotic maids. It's doing something really cool with the visuals and mechanics, and I'd definitely check it out if you're into mascot horror or analog horror. Claytown Horror is a stylized horror experience that visually feels like a child's reconstruction of a nightmare. While the puzzles didn't particularly hook me, the style and horror set pieces are definitely worth giving a shot. I haven't seen much of My Friendly Neighborhood, but it feels a bit Bioshock inspired, with a good balance of horror and comedy, utilizing friendly puppet characters, some nice stylization, and what seems like a pretty ambitious scale. On the topic of puppets, Hello Puppets seems to take a note from Avenue Q's handbook, and creates a frightening VR horror experience with a hand puppet literally sewn to your hand. Outside of mascot horror, here are some other indie horror games I've been playing or keeping my eye on. Endoparasitic. I have not finished it yet, but I am a decent way through the game, armed with literally only one arm, you navigate a research base overrun with mutated monsters. Also, you have a massive parasitic bug in your spine crawling to your brain. It's a classic survival horror style game that also kind of feels like an old flash gimmick game like Quop in the best possible way. Kitty Horror Show very well may be the topic of my next video. She's an indie dev who makes these really atmospheric and effective games from the Haunted Cities volumes to the House of Leaves-esque anatomy. It's incredible work. I've brought this up over on my Patreon as well, but the Haunted PS1 demo disc is an incredible project that aggregates a ton of PlayStation 1 inspired horror game demos and short experiences experiences and combines them in a really, really nice and sometimes themed launcher every year. Some of my favorites have been Walk, Ten Dead Doves, and Gob, but there's so much good stuff over there. There's so much good indie horror out there right now, just waiting for you to play it. And I think we're at a better place for indie horror than ever before. Iron Lung is getting a film, new and unique creative projects are being released every day. All it takes is a little effort to be able to find something that really speaks to you. Thank you all for watching. I've got a sources document in the description below, and the music for this video should be up on my Spotify and my newly created Bandcamp. Let me know what indie horror projects you've been into lately. I genuinely love getting to discover new hidden gems. I'll see you all next time. Hey.